All right. Today is Sunday, February 13th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And now that the Super Bowl is over, welcome to the second best show in America. Despite my giant ego, I cannot compete with the Super Bowl, so I had to wait to release this video afterwards. And without further ado, here it is, in focus tonight. How about a revisit to the Wall of Worry? Let's start with how the events unfolded this week. On Thursday, we got the CPI, aka the CPI for inflation, and the number came out hot, 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 despite the cooking. We got the hottest reading for inflation in this country since 1982. That was, within itself, one massive shoe that dropped right on the head of the stock market. But guess what? The geniuses, the retail crowd, the pumpers, they bought the dip, and the reason is their brain-dead zombies hooked up with meth looking for the next score. They're stripped away from any critical thinking, any rationale, oh, the CPI is too hot, maybe the Fed will have to be more aggressive. No, none of that thinking goes through in their little brains. The thinking goes, oh, perhaps it's peak inflation. That means we have to buy the loop. And then they get slaughtered right away. Why? Because the next shoe dropped right on the top of their heads, and this time, the size is bigger. The shoe came from James Bullard, the San Luis Fed president, who's a voting member, by the way, this time around, and he got a little high and issued a blunt statement suggesting that perhaps the Fed will increase interest rates by a full percentage point by June. And perhaps the Fed will have to increase interest rates by 50 basis points in the upcoming March meeting. On top of that, Bullard, perhaps hinted that the Fed could hold emergency meetings to either increase interest rates right away or perhaps announce the end of all purchasing programs abruptly and that rattled the market dramatically. We saw a flush down erasing all of the gains, all of the stupid dip buying right away. What do you know comes Friday in the morning, pre-market of course, we hear from other Fed presidents and other Fed zombies saying that, whoa, Bullard is the outlier, he's the rebel. We don't agree with Bullard. We're going to take a more um, measured approach. You know, assuming that inflation is still transitory. And what do you know? The futures popped up higher right away in the green because this market is a junkie. It doesn't care about anything but the cocaine from the Fed. If we have other Fed voting members saying that the Fed's cocaine policy will not be removed right away. It's going to take a gradual approach and maybe we're not going to take it away at all. That remains the delusional hope for market bulls that the Fed is just bluffing and they will never raise interest rates because the level of debt that we have in the economy, yada, yada, yada. And let me school you on one thing here. Do you really think that all of these Fed zombies came out of the woodworks issuing a statement negating Bullard on Friday morning, pre-market, as a coincidence? Of course not. What happened is we have an oligarch who did not like what Bullard said, grabbed the phone, talked to the Fed, saying, I need all of you to come out Friday morning, call Steve Leisman, CNBC, and issue a statement that you guys do not agree with Bullard. And by the way, book Bullard on Monday so he can clean up the mess that he did on Thursday. This is how the system works, whether we like it or not. It's an oligarchy, full-blown oligarchy. There is no capitalism here. And guess what? The market started to move higher. It looked, at least, that the market could move and close some gaps and recover a little bit on Friday. Some short covering, perhaps. And then came another massive shoe to drop right on the top of the heads of the dip buyers. And this time around, it came from Russia, Ukraine, the tensions. Perhaps we have an invasion, perhaps we don't have an invasion. But this time around, the market's reaction was different. Right away, we saw crude oil prices spiking higher. On top of that, gold exploded higher, and the stock market took a massive leg down. In previous episodes, when we heard that perhaps Russia will invade Ukraine imminently, the market did not react. This time, it was different. And even after Coffee Boy, Jake Sullivan came out with the press conference, and by the way, the guy used to deliver coffee and DoorDash to the White House. All of a sudden, he's in charge of national security. Anyways, even after he came on TV and said, we don't know for sure. We're not saying we know. We're not saying we don't know. Maybe this, maybe that, perhaps could have, would have, who knows. Even after that, the market sustained the negativity and it did not recover at all. 
And by the way, we gotta be careful when we make fun of Coffee Boy Sullivan because when you take off the human mask, this is what he actually looks like. He knows where you are, he knows who you are, he knows where you live, he knows what you eat, he knows everything about you. So watch out. But anyways, here is the Wall of Worry, and every time we talk about the Wall of Worry, you know it's serious because something is happening. The dip buying strategy was successful last year, and the reason is we did not have so many elements in the Wall of Worry playing out at the same time, mainly a hawkish Fed. The Fed has been so-called accommodative until the fourth quarter of last year. And even after that, they were still buying bonds, they were still buying mortgage-backed securities, they were still easing, the interest rate still at zero, etc., etc. But now, as we get more data about inflation, the Fed is becoming more hawkish. And this is exactly what's different this time around, and why the dip-buying strategy is not working anymore. On top of that, when we see more items in the Wall of Worry playing out, oh boy, it's gonna get ugly here. Because it's not just the hawkish Fed, now we have Russia playing out. And who knows what else? Now, let's review the items on the Wall of Worry, and we start with the brothel in DC. We also have uh, China, Russia, The Thing, and lastly, and most importantly, The Hawk. Let's start with the brothel in DC and see if we have anything new here. Perhaps the bulls can find some hope here. The answer is probably not. And the reason is the fiscal spending package, that's dead for now. It's gone. Poof. No more build back better, and even parts of it. And the reason is, after the inflation readings that we got on Thursday, we have Mitch McConnell and the Republicans pretty much saying we will not support any bill at this point, and the priority of the administration should be tackling inflation. But who cares, because the Republicans don't hold the power in either chambers. But we have the de facto president of the United States, Senator Joe Manchin, and he is now vehemently against any spending bill, specifically Build Back Better. Not gonna happen, and the reason is inflation, so forget about the fiscal spending and the fiscal policy to save your ass. Nothing will come out of the fiscal side. Matter of fact, if anything, only bad news will come out of the fiscal side this time around. What else? Perhaps China. Maybe the bulls can find some hope from China. Not really, but perhaps the absence of any bad news is good news from China. Because for now, they're busy with the Olympics and nothing is coming out. Although we're seeing more censorship and more draconian approaches. But hey, this is also happening here in this country. And the sheep are supporting all of that. Matter of fact, they want more of it. Yet the real risk when it comes to China will come from any possible invasion of Taiwan, perhaps a copycat, if the invasion of Ukraine is indeed successful. This is one thing we gotta keep in mind and watch closely. Next, what about the thing? Let's talk about the thing for a little bit here. Is the market worried about the thing anymore? The answer is not really. Are people worried about the thing anymore? Not really. The majority of people now are getting sick of it. We're done. It's over. And the assumption was that once the Pokemon variant is over, we're gonna see the resumption of splurging in this economy. And this will be good for the pace of economic growth and economic activities in the goods, but specifically the services sector of the economy. This is all a fantasy, of course, because the majority of people did not give a rat's ass and they went out anyways. So if there was any splurging in the economy, or it already took place, it's not gonna happen again. There was nobody waiting for the government to come out and say officially, hey folks, the thing is over. You may now go ahead and party and do whatever you want. There is some sort of a fatigue here of us waiting and waiting for that to happen. Once it happens, it's already priced in, the consumer already spent their stimulus, they already exhausted their savings, and now they're swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. So the spending reserves are cooling down. Meaning, it doesn't matter if the thing is over or not. The splurging will not happen, and from this point on, we're gonna see a stagnant economy. And you better hope that inflation goes down, otherwise we're gonna have stagflation in this economy. Another point when it comes to the thing. What if we have a new variant that comes out? Unless it has a higher fatality rate, I don't think the public will be receptive to any more restrictions at this point. So for all intents and purposes, the thing is over for now. And oh, by the way, when we talk about the thing, remember everything we talked about that we got hit and censored and unsubscribed, bro, because we said things that at the time were considered to be crazy. And now the facts are coming out pretty much confirming everything we said in the past that is true. One of them is this. Remember the booster? As Fauci says, well, we now know that the effectiveness wanes after four months. And this is officially, by the way. So now they're saying, hey, perhaps we need a fourth one. You need a fourth dose. So keep rolling those sleeves. 
and before you know it, you're on your 17th booster. And I say no thanks, I'm just getting a Pfizer tattoo in my arm. Anyways, back to the wall of worry. Perhaps the most important item right now, besides the hawkish Fed, is Russia and what's going on vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. We thought that President Macaroni, when he visited Russia, maybe he's gonna work out a deal here and we don't have to worry about Russia invading Ukraine. Well, what do you know, as expected in this program, President Macaroni will come up with no deal and this is exactly what happened. Because he offended Putin's ego by not submitting to a test for the thing. We already know that Putin is freaking out about the thing and therefore when Macaroni refused to take a test because he thought his DNA might be stolen. Well, I got news for you, President Macaroni. Remember those uh, Russian hookers back in 03? Yep, they were not hookers. They were KGB agents, and they got your DNA, baby. Too late for that. But anyhow, he made a mess out of himself and looked like an absolute fool with a big table separating him away, and then the guy didn't even shake his hands when he said goodbye. It was an absolute humiliation for President Macaroni. So we don't have a deal and time is ticking right now. What they're saying right now is the date will be Wednesday, February 17th. That will be the date for the invasion. So who the hell is going to buy the dip right now in the stock market? Yes, Bullard could come out in the morning and say, I misspoke. I didn't mean to say what I said. The oligarchs got mad and they called me and they said, hey, you got to step back here. Oops, I wasn't supposed to say that. But anyways, uh, I misspoke. We're not going to increase interest rates right now. Matter of fact, if anything, we're going to cut interest rates. What do you know? The stock market blasts higher. The problem is the dip buyers buy comes Wednesday we have an invasion and here we go again and by the way absent from the coverage of this story they talk about NATO they talk about Ukraine they talk about this and that but they never talk about the real reason behind the tensions here and the real reason is inflation you might have heard of it by now and look at this the Russian central bank has been hiking, hiking, hiking pushing those interest rates higher and higher and higher to tame the inflation crisis in Russia and nothing is happening. Inflation continues to move higher. Why are we seeing this phenomenon? It's the same story, by the way, across many economies. You see central banks increasing interest rates higher, yet inflation continues to move higher. Because it all depends on the central bank of the world, the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. If the Fed continues to be delusional and it doesn't increase interest rates higher, then guess what? It doesn't matter what the Bank of Russia is going to do. All of these commodities are dollarized. Their prices continue to move higher due to the Fed's policy until and unless the Fed starts to tighten inflation is not going to go down in Russia in China in Korea in Brazil in Mexico and hence I keep saying when the US sneezes you're gonna catch cancer this is how it works but we do have a massive inflation problem in Russia Russia if you're not aware is one of the most important countries in the world when it comes to inflation why because it is a commodities giant. They produce oil, they produce gas, they produce palladium, they produce lithium, copper, most importantly meats, and wheat, grains. So a war between these two countries will usher a tsunami of inflation worldwide. And the reason is these two countries are hubs for commodities, specifically grains. Any disruption of the flow of grains, prices will shoot up higher and this will contribute to higher inflation globally. Listen to this piece from last summer. It's really important because you will understand perhaps the real reason behind the invasion of Ukraine. The headline reads, Putin's drive to tame food prices threatens grain sector. And this is back from last summer. I'm not reading this for you to tell a story. I'm reading this for you because there is a point here. During a televised speech with ordinary Russians, a woman pressed President Vladimir Putin on high food prices. Gotta be careful here. Pressing Putin, not a good strategy. Anyhow, Valentina slipped Tasova challenged the president on why bananas from Ecuador are now cheaper in Russia than domestically produced carrots. She also asked how her mother can survive on a subsistence wage, quote unquote, with the cost of staples like potatoes so high. Putin acknowledged high food costs were a problem, including the so called borscht basket. Of basic vegetables blaming global price increases and domestic shortages but he said the russian government had taken steps to address the issue and that other measures were being discussed without elaborating sleptasova represents a problem for putin who relies on broad public consent the steep increases in consumer prices are unsettling some voters particularly older russians and small pensions we do not want to see a return to the 1990s when skyrocketing inflation led to food shortages. Interesting, isn't it? Wait, 
it gets even better. That has prompted Putin to push the government to take steps to tackle inflation. The government's steps have included tax on wheat exports, which was introduced last month on permanent basis and capping the retail price on other basic foodstuffs. But in doing so, the president faces a tough choice. In trying to head off discontent among voters at rising prices, he risks hurting Russia's agricultural sector, with the country's farmers complaining that new taxes are discouraging them from making long-term investments. The moves by Russia, the world's top weed exporter, also have fed inflation in other countries by driving the cost of grain. Now they have an export tax on wheat. Russia is the top producer of wheat in the world. What does that mean? It might hurt the farmers by a little bit, but everybody who imports wheat from Russia is paying that extra tax. So inflation continues to move higher. Continuing, an increase in the export tax unveiled in mid-January, for example, sent global prices to their highest level in seven years. How could we, or how could Putin, solve this problem, by the way? Since wheat is getting more expensive, the supply is nowhere to be found in Russia, what do you do to increase the supply of wheat? Hmm, how about this? Russia is already one of the top exporters of grains across the globe. We have the US, we have China, we have the rest of the world, Brazil, etc. But among the top exporters of grains in the world, even more than Russia, is the country of Ukraine, with over 63 million tons of exports. It's starting to make sense, right? Here's more. When we look at the map, and this is, by the way, from National Geographic. The picture might be a little blurry, but this is how they uploaded it. You might want to squint your eyes a little bit. You can see this large country that we call Ukraine. And then you have all of these pipes, gas pipelines in green, and then we have oil pipelines in red. The majority of these pipelines go through two countries before they reach Western Europe, but primarily Germany. These two countries are Belarus and Ukraine. Belarus is already a satellite state for Russia. They have a good grip on the politics in Belarus. Now, Russia used to have a good grip on Ukraine. Ukraine used to be a satellite state for Russia until 2014 when the revolution happens and now Ukraine is on the side of the Western allies, US and the European Union. This is not good for Russia. Putin doesn't like this because all of his pipelines, be it gas or oil, go through Ukraine, meaning he's beholden to Ukraine. Here's another map. Perhaps you can see it clearer here. In uh, pink, red, whatever that is, purple, doesn't matter to me. These are gas pipelines in blue, oil pipelines. He doesn't have a problem when it comes to Belarus, but look at how many pipes go through Ukraine. This is a major problem for Moscow, hence another reason behind the invasion. See, they talk about the politics and NATO and all of that in the news, but they seldom cover the economic aspect of this conflict, which, by the way, is driven by inflation. There is another problem. If an invasion happens and we see tensions between Russia and Ukraine and we see a shortage of supplies from the two countries, because, believe it or not, Russia is the top exporter of oil to the United States, higher than Mexico and higher than Saudi Arabia. Another one. We talked about about palladium. Remember that one? Palladium goes into the production of cars, the catalytic converters, but also in chips. Uh-oh. Russia could hit U.S. chip industry, White House warns. What are they talking about here? Is what they're talking about. The potential for retaliation has garnered more attention in recent days after Texit a market research group published a report on February 1st, highlighting the reliance of many semiconductor manufacturers on Russian and Ukrainian sourced materials like neon, palladium, and others. According to TechSite estimate, over 90% of U.S. semiconductor-grade neon supplies come from Ukraine while 35% of U.S. palladium is sourced from Russia. Peter Harrell, who sits at the White House National Security Council, and his staff have been in touch with members of the chip industry in recent days, learning about their exposure to Russian and Ukrainian chip-making materials, and urging them to find alternative resources, or sources, I should say. How the hell are they going to find alternative sources? China? Anyways? The bottom line here, folks, is the following. Russia-Ukraine tensions could mean more expensive cars and bread. We talked about wheat, we talked about palladium, we have also platinum and many other materials and commodities that come out of Russia and Ukraine. The bottom line is, and it ties up 
Here's the segue for you. It ties up with the hawkish Fed. If we have a disruption in supplies between Russia and Ukraine, or from Russia and Ukraine, I should say, this will add to higher inflation. Higher inflation will push the Fed to become even more hawkish. If the Fed becomes more hawkish, say goodbye to the stock market. We're going to have another massive leg to the downside. That leads us to the last and perhaps most important item in the wall of worry. How about the hawk, the Federal Reserve? Led by Jerome Powell, the delusional madman. This is what we have when it comes to inflation. It is sky high, surging out of whack, and it is entrenched across the economy. Whether we're talking about used cars, up over 40% year over year. Gasoline, up 40% year over year. Rental cars, 29% year over year. Transportation, 21% year over year. Hotel rooms, 20.5% year over year. Furniture, 17%. And it goes on and on and on. And inflation is hitting many states, specifically the mountains states the most. And the reason is a lot of folks are moving away from the coasts to the mountain states, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Idaho, pushing home prices higher. And therefore, inflation in these states is surpassing the rate of inflation in the rest of the nation. Here's the problem when it comes to the Fed's policy. You continue to hear the way behind the curve. What does that mean, way behind the curve? Look at this. In, uh, I guess, Burgundy, the federal funds rate, this is the Fed's interest rate. And in blue, we have the 10-year yield. In orange, the CPI growth year over year. I don't know if you can spot it or not, but here it is. Notice that the last time the Fed increased the federal funds rate was around 2004 to tackle inflation. But inflation did not go down until 2006. So there is a lag before we see the impact on the CPI inflation. Meaning if the Fed raises interest rates right now, it's going to take a while before we see a dent in the CPI. And the worst scenario is if the Fed remains callous about the problem and increases interest rates in the upcoming March meeting by only 25 basis points. Because this will take a lag before we see the impact on inflation and 25 basis points is nothing. Then the Fed looks around and says, you know what, we bumped interest rates higher by 25 five basis points, inflation is still going higher. And now they have to slam their foot in the brakes and increase interest rates by more than 50 basis points, maybe more than 100 basis points. And this will crash the stock market, real estate market, and the economy one million percent guaranteed. So the Fed has to thread the needle here carefully. They're already too late right now. And hence, market expectations are for 50 basis points in March in the bag now, 100% probability that the Fed will increase interest rates in March by 50 basis points. In the bag right now. And look at this, even more alarming, by the way. The chances for 50 to 75 basis points have increased dramatically. We now have at least 50% chance that the Fed will increase interest rates by 75 basis points in the March meeting. That will indeed be shock and awe. And perhaps this is what the Fed needs to tackle this inflation problem. The problem is, shocking the market by 75 basis points increase will hit the market really hard, and perhaps the economy too. Again, folks, there is no escape here. Recession has always, always been the remedy to inflation. Even Goldman Sachs is coming out now and predicting seven interest rate hikes by the end of the year. When you look at inflation, CPI excess inflation, whether we're looking at vehicles, household goods, electronics, reopening, energy, shelter, food, other, doesn't matter. Everything is moving higher. This is, after all, the inflation superstorm, not the transitory one. And inflation is going to continue to move higher and higher and higher. Why? Because we have wage inflation, among many other forms of inflation, by the way. But wage inflation is more sticky because you pay employees right now, you're not going to take that back when inflation goes down. It is a permanent sort of inflation. Wage inflation is moving higher. We're seeing financial institutions offering millions of dollars in salaries. In certain cases, folks, and I know that Personally, because I work in this industry, we are seeing certain talent being offered more in salary than the top executives in the company. This is how desperate they are for talent. And yet folks are rejecting those jobs. They don't want to do them anymore. They have other options. And hence, wage inflation will continue to move higher. And wage inflation is not just happening in the top tier of earners. It is happening more specifically in the bottom tier of earners. Take, for example, retail workers. You and I are familiar with the story of Starbucks and the efforts of unionization, pushing wages higher and higher and higher. We also have Apple now increasing wages in the retail stores because they cannot find employees. So wage inflation is still hot 
it's not going away anytime soon. We talk about commodities inflation. We talk about wage inflation. We talk about energy inflation. We talk about rent inflation all the time in this channel. But perhaps we don't talk enough about the role of crime in pushing inflation higher. The headline from the Hills read, The Fed must control inflation for public safety's sake. Have you noticed the rise of crime that comes hand in hand with the rise of inflation? We have an insane wave of crime in this country right now. And what happens is, once crime surges, is out of control, it creates a vicious feedback loop cycle where we're now seeing a lot of retail stores being robbed in an organized crime effort. In response to the rise of crime, we're seeing a lot of retail stores across the country hiring more security, investing in more security measures, etc. etc. This is an extra cost incurred by these stores to tackle the rise of crime. What do you think will happen? They will pass that extra cost down to you and I, the consumer. We are going to pay for that cost, and hence inflation moves higher as crime also starts to move higher. And this is not just happening in this country. South of the border, they've been having a problem with crime for so long now, but it is getting even worse, and it could impact American consumers. The cartel in Mexico is now gouging prices for lime. You're having your Super Bowl party, you want some lime, Time, that's going to cost you more because you're going to pay the cartel. We also have an avocado war in Mexico, where the cartel is also being involved in the avocado trade. And hence, you might have noticed that the price of your Super Bowl guacamole went a little higher than last year. And this will continue to go on and on and on. We're seeing a lot of theft of catalytic converters. And the reason is palladium and platinum prices are surging out of whack. And it goes on and on. And now even BlackRock is saying to the Fed, just stop. Investors want the Fed to quit buying bonds right now. We don't have time to wait till the March meeting. And this is becoming increasingly alarming. Even Larry Summers is saying that the Fed should hold an immediate meeting. Now wait until March to end the assets purchasing programs. And this is according to Larry Summers. It gotta happen right now. The headline reads, could the Fed convene a surprise meeting to hike interest rates? Question mark. The markets are beginning to price it in... Uh oh. And of course, it is walloping stocks. If the Fed cannot even wait till March, because that's too late, then we are in major, major trouble in this economy. Matter of fact, markets are now betting against the Fed's guidance. Remember the dot plots? They're saying that's going to move higher. Bet against the Fed. They're way behind. But hey, rest assured, if all of this scared you a little bit, hey, Maverick of Wall Street, you're too negative. You just share these bad news. I don't want to watch your channel anymore. I want to see some positivity. Here's some positivity for you. Remember Joker, Rick Newman from Yahoo? What a stupid son of a bitch. The propagandist for the oligarchs? Well, he says why high inflation may actually be beneficial for you. Newman says three upsides to high inflation. Remember, this is the same guy who gave the Biden's economy an A-. minus. And this is his latest article, by the way, a nasty article. Should be qualified as hate speech. He says, angry truckers go home. Now, a lot of people feel the same sentiment here. But listen to this. This is just a little piece of the article. Just so you can understand how big of a piece of shit this guy is. The angry truckers are also making it impossible for hundreds of businesses in Ottawa to operate. These include many smaller businesses that do not have the cash to draw to shut down indefinitely. Oh, really? Now, you're worried about small businesses shutting down indefinitely? You guys, the jab cult, were behind the shutdowns that destroyed small businesses permanently. Now, you're worried about small businesses? You propagandist, give me a break. He also says, the truckers are harming the livelihood of ordinary workers, and it may not be too strong to call them economic terrorists. Wow, if you are with the truckers, you are pro-inflation, anti-prosperity, anti-work, and in reality, anti-freedom. What a piece of shit this guy is. A why? Are they doing this laughable propaganda, by the way? You're already seeing it on Twitter with the bots, right? I went to the store, empty shelves, and the store manager says it's due to the truckers. Oh, really? We've been seeing empty shelves for a while now, but they want to find a new boogeyman to blame inflation on. Because in reality, this is what's going on in the political arena when it comes to inflation. One-fifth of Americans believe Biden will be a successful president. One fifth. Nearly 60% of Americans disapprove of Biden's job's performance. 60%. 
And the number one reason is inflation. Inflation is hurting this administration, so the propagandists are now looking for a new boogeyman to blame this inflation on. How about the Fed? Because that wouldn't be a lie, by the way. Inflation is always, always a monetary phenomenon. The Fed and the money supply is solely responsible for this inflation. And by the way, the Fed also needs a nice uh, little distraction here because of their insider trading scandal. Oh, it's getting worse by the day. The headline from the Wall Street Journal reads, Fed staff reported securities trades amid the bank's 2020 stimulus move. The Fed says employees complied with the rules, of course. Some trades made by family members. And folks, with all of this uh, divisiveness, hostility, and hate that's going on in the country right now, perhaps the new item in the wall of worry will be this. How about civil war? UCSD political scientist who studies civil wars worries that the U.S. is headed toward one. Uh oh But hey, at least a few years after the Civil War, we can make good musicals out of it. Think about it. Anyhow, folks, we're going to move on here to cover the market information for you. We start with the performance of the indices last week. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average on Friday closed in the red, down by 503.53 points, or a decline of 1.43%. The Nasdaq down big, 394.49 points, or a decline of 2.78%. The S&P 500, similar story here, down 50, excuse me, 85.44 points or a decline of 1.90%. What about the sector's performance on Friday? Leading the pack, capturing the gold, silver, and bronze energy, the only sector that managed to close in the green, while the laggards were led by technology, cyclicals, and communication services. Let's contrast this with the performance of the week. Leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal. No, it's not energy. It is materials at number one look at that and then we have at number two energy there is no number three because every other sector of the market closed in the red for the week so we have two classic inflationary sectors of the market energy and materials moving higher in the green and the rest of the market in the dumps and this is within itself a signal for us market participants what is this signal you might ask how about the fact that inflation is eroding away corporate earnings across the board it is destroying the stock market every single corner with the exception of the two inflationary sectors that continue to move higher and benefit with higher inflation energy commodities materials these are the sectors that benefit from higher inflation. We are now moving from the honeymoon phase of inflation where industrials, consumer staples, healthcare, technology firms gain from inflation because they have a pricing power. But this pricing power is limited when we move from the honeymoon phase of inflation to the ugly phase where the pricing power erodes drastically. And you're seeing this for many corporate earnings that we got throughout the week. Classic inflationary names, they're now losing. And what is left standing the answer is energy and materials. What about the advance to decline ratios on Friday? NYSE 32% advancing versus 64% declining. NASDAQ 26% advancing versus 70% declining. Commodities, futures, what's going on here? A massive pop in energy prices, specifically crude, WTI, Brent, didn't matter. They all moved higher on the heels of the news that Russia is about to invade. The WTI gained almost 4.5% on Friday. Brent gained almost 4%. Gasoline prices were higher. Heating oil was up almost 4%. Natural gas, everything moved higher when it came to energy. On the other hand, softs were down all in all. The losses were led by OJ, lumber, coffee, cocoa, cotton, on the other hand, sugar, pretty much on the flat line. Another gainer on the heels of the news that we got regarding the tensions between Russia and Ukraine is metals, but specific metals, in this case gold. Why gold? Because now, as I've been predicting by the way, market participants are realizing that gold is good. Gold is a good store of value when we have no other corner to hide in. Stocks are not working, bonds are not working, real estate's not gonna work. Why not gold? Gold moved higher by almost one and a quarter percent on Friday. On the other hand, we have modest gains for silver. And look at this, palladium. We talked about the shortages of palladium from Russia. Palladium shot up higher by over 2%. On the other hand, copper got whacked on Friday. Went down by over 4.5%. Likewise, platinum was down by almost 1.5%. What about meats? Muted action for live and feeder cattle futures. And look at this, the new big tech. Lean hogs getting slaughtered. Down almost one and a quarter percent on Friday. What happened in grains? Grains are moving higher, specifically wheat. We have tensions between Russia and Ukraine, 
That means shortages in wheat, wheat shot up higher by almost 3.5% on Friday. Likewise, we saw gains in rough rice, corn, soybean oil, soybean meal, soybeans, all higher on Friday. On the other hand, we have modest losses here for oats and canola. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on? On Friday, the hottest table by far was Apple, with around 1.1 million contracts traded for the name. About 53.5% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle. With about 1 million contracts, about 49% of those were calls. And number three, AMD, with almost 1 million contracts, about 64% of those were calls. And here it is, the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. How about the trades for the ticker DKNG DraftKings? This is what is known as a strangle trade, meaning you buy a call, you buy a put at the same time, because you're not sure where the trade is going to go. But you are sure that DraftKings is going to move impulsively one way or the other, either up 20% or down 20%. You're not sure which way. So you buy a call and you buy a put with a target of a 20% move in mind. In this case, the buyer of this trade opened the 28 calls for the expiration date, February 18th. They also bought the 18 and a half puts for the same expiration date of February 18th, with the expectations that DraftKings could move one way or the other by 20% or more, and they paid about 40 cents a piece by buying the 28 calls, and they paid about 20 bucks a piece from opening the 18 and a half puts, bringing the total to about 60 cents a piece, all in all spending about $600,000. What about the trade for the ticker NCLH, Norwegian Cruises? The buying calls here, the 23 calls for the expiration date, March 4th, with the expectations. The Norwegian Cruises could move higher by more than 7% by then. They paid about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $600,000. And what about the trade for the ticker QQQ for the NASDAQ? The buying puts here, interesting, the 321 puts for the expiration date, February 23rd, with the expectations that the Qs could move down by more than 7.5% by then. They paid about $1.65 a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending about $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? Once again, the buying puts with expectations of more downside here. In this case, they bought the 418 puts for the expiration date, March 11th. With the expectations, the SPY could drop down by more than 5% by then. They paid about 5 bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $3 million. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker S triple Qs? This is the inverse index of the Qs. In this case, they're buying puts on the S triple Qs, meaning it is actually a bullish bet for the Qs, expecting the Qs to move higher and hence the S triple Qs to move down. Interesting. In this case, they bought the 34 puts for the expiration date March 11th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 18% by then. They paid about 85 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $400,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis. Ugly, bloodbath on Friday, nothing worked, with very few exceptions. After the news regarding Russia, Ukraine, after that came out, we saw a pop in gold. Gold moved higher. Likewise, energy moved higher. Exxon, Chevron, all outperformed. We also seen defense contractors moving higher. Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, a big on Friday. And of course, the at performers since the beginning of the day, regardless of the news from Russia, Ukraine, believe it or not, was tobacco stocks, led by, of course, Philip Morris. Let's contrast this heat map with the weekly heat map and let's see what's going on here. A little better, but again, it is a bloodbath for the most important names to the market. We're talking about Microsoft, we're talking about Apple, Google, Facebook, Tesla, the chips, Qualcomm, AMD, down big. The indices are not going to perform and move higher based on the at performance of staples, energy, materials, defense contractors, certain financials, certain software names that pop due to earnings. That's not enough. The market needs the big caps to move higher. Unfortunately for now, unfortunately for the bulls, of course, good news for the bears, we're seeing exodus from these big cap names. And this is an alarming development for the stock market. It used to be the RKK names getting shot. Nobody paid attention at all. Okay, they were high value. Who cares? It's a bad time. But now we're seeing the big caps getting shot. This is not a good development for the stock market. And here's the weekly heat map for the ETFs. Again, inverse indices for technology outperformed big. 
the S triple Qs, the S O X S for chips. Yet you look at the small camps, the IWM was in the green, energy was in the green, materials up big, biotech also performed, gold outperformed, regional banks, the KRE outperformed. So there are corners of the stock market that you can work with, but you gotta be really picky and careful. Another important development looking at this heat map, a lot of you skip the heat map analysis, but you're missing out because we spotted the upcoming pop in technology and growth by looking at the heat map. I'm now spotting that perhaps the bear market rally in growth is coming to an end. Why? Because when we look at the contrast from the weekly heat map between value and growth, both of them are down, but still value at perform growth. Growth was down big, the IWF was down over 2.5%. Value, the IWD, was only down by a little over half a percentage point. So perhaps we will see a rotation back into value. But for all intents and purposes right now, you gotta be careful with growth. Lastly, what about international markets? The ad performer remains the commodities heavy, the EWZ for the Brazilian ETF. My pick, by the way, still bragging about it, the EWZ is still at performing the rest of global markets. Moving on to charts, and we start with the 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500. Look at that nasty flush down that we got on Friday. Once 451 was broken, you knew it was bad because the chart has been grinding against 451 over and over and over again as resistance. And it failed to do that, so they resorted to cheating and they gapped above 451. Now, on the way down, once you see 451 broken, the floodgates are gonna open because that was an important number on the upside and it's gonna be important on the way to the downside. We lost 451, we lost 446 and a half, we lost 443, it is a massacre. And we're now looking down at 438 for support. On the other hand, 441, as resistance. In all likelihood, the chart is going to go down to retest the line in the sand at around 430. And that test will be met by failure in all likelihood. We will assess when we get there. But look at where the RSI indicator is reading, by the way, from a 30 minutes perspective. The chart is severely oversold right now. The best case for the bears, believe it or not, is if the market gaps up higher, fixing all of these oversold conditions on the RSI. Then we see yet again, sell the rip. This will be the best outcome for the bears. The worst outcome for the bears is if the chart opens gapping down big and then it rebounds higher. If the chart opens down big, you gotta book some profits here if you're short at least for the initial pop higher, and then you can short again. If you are bullish the market, what do you look for in this chart? It is bad. Do you have what it takes to buy the dip at this point? When you see failure after failure after failure after failure, the psychology is important here. And therefore I say, if we see a pop in the morning, a gap higher, in all likelihood, it's gonna be sell the rip. The bulls are not gonna feel they're in the clear yet until we see a retest to the line in the sand at 4.30. And that retest holds. We'll see. But for now, we're moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. Once we got the double top, the reversal candle, you knew it's bad. And you gotta abandon your longs. We said that exactly in this channel. Now we got the confirmation. We lost the most important number. 4,472. It's gone now. The bulls have no case. The bears have gained all the momentum right now. Matter of fact, speaking of, the momentum indicators are curling down. Is this bullish or bearish? The answer is it is bearish. We're also seeing volume spiking higher on the downside. On the selling side, is this bullish or bearish? The answer is it is bearish. When we look at the pattern, we have a double top. We've broken the most important support line. We're now looking down at 4,384 and a half. The bears have complete advantage at this point. And here's a daily chart for the SPX, the cash index for the S&P 500. Look at that. It was all good so long as the SPX is training above the 200 days moving average. Once you break below the 200 days moving average, buckle up your seat belts and get the hell out. It's not a good close, specifically the weekly close below the 200 days moving average. In all likelihood, and this is a dire prediction, by the way, it's not going to happen in one shot, but in all likelihood, we're going down to retest 4,000 as support. Moving on to the Qs, 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? Similar story with the SPY, the chart never broke above 365 and a half. It never really closed the gap. Once the chart broke and below 360, that was an alarming signal, get out, abandon, jump ship, it's over. Because again, 
It was an important number on the way up. The chart tried over and over and over again to break above that number. Now, on the way to the downside, if that number doesn't hold, good night, Irene. It's over. You get out. And look at that. We lost 360. We lost 352. We're now looking down to 343, the line in the sand. That will be the next retest and perhaps the most important retest. But again, look at where the RSI is reading right now. It is way oversold. Can we get a bounce, in the morning at least, to retest 352 as resistance this time around? Yes, we can. And in all likelihood, not a guarantee, but in all likelihood, that will be an opportunity to sell the rip. Here it is, a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Look at the pattern for the chart. We have what it appears to be a double top, not a clean one, but again, the chart broken below the most important line of 14,445, and it closed below that line. It's over. The momentum indicators are curling down. The volume is spiking higher on the selling side. The bears have closed in. They slaughtered the bulls. The bears are in total control right now. Thank you to Mr. Bullard and Putin. And here's the daily chart for the NDX, for the NASDAQ. And once again, look at the 200 days moving average in white. It didn't look good from the get-go once the channel was broken. Remember, that channel goes back all the way to 2020. Once you break a long trend line like this, it's over. They say the trend is your friend until the very end. Well, we are at the very end. The end already happened. But there was a glimpse of hope here. So long as the Qs, the NASDAQ in this case, was trading above the 200 days moving average. The chart broke below the 200 days moving average in a flush down. It found a bottom. It started a bear rally, bear market rally, I should say. And it reclimbed the 200 days moving average. So far, so good. The problem is, the break above the 200 days moving average lasted for only one day. And then the chart pulled back and it got rejected again from the 200 days moving average. That is an ominous sign, folks. It's over. You're not going to climb that channel again. It's going to take years for the chart to do that. That rejection from the 200 days moving average sealed the deal. And by the way, look at the monthly chart for the NDX. Do I need to say anything here? Look at the MACD. It's over, folks. It's done. And if we apply Fibonacci here, I'm not going to feel safe buying the dip until I see at least another 9% drop to the next Fibonacci support at around 13,000. And then I'd be interested. I will reassess, of course, before I buy. What about the IWM small caps, the Russell 2000 30 minutes chart? It looks a lot better than the Qs and the SPY. Perhaps this is the only remaining hope for the bulls. Remember what they say, the IWM is a leading indicator. Well, if it is, then the bulls should feel excited at least that the IWM did not go down big like the NASDAQ. Regardless, the chart lost the support 204 and a half. We're now looking down at 196 and a half for support. The bad news for the Russell is this. When we switch to a weekly chart for the rut, the big Russell 2000, well, look at this. The chart was in a consolidation range. The support at around 2100, the resistance 2360. And it has been in this consolidation zone for over a year now. The problem is we had a false breakout to the upside. Once you have a false breakout, I told you back then, it means that the real breakout will happen to the downside. And this is exactly what we got right now. However, in typical charting behavior, when you break such an important zone like this, you don't flush down right away in one shot. You gotta retest it. You gotta try again. And the chart in this case re-attempted to climb 2100 as support, and it failed, at least for now. This is yet again an ominous signal for the stock market, specifically when you combine it with the fact that the NDX, the NASDAQ, got rejected once again from the 200 days moving average. Here's a daily chart for the Dixie, the dollar index, tricky Dixie. It is trying right now to reclimb 96 to support. I'm keeping my bear flag, but I don't have a high conviction that the dollar will go down because the tailwinds for the US dollar remain intact. Matter of fact, they're getting stronger. And if the dollar pops, could that derail the rally that we got on Friday in gold? Perhaps, but look at this. Gold scored massive gains on Friday. It is now trading above the three amigos, 1,835. It's done now. Look away the chart found resistance exactly to the penny at the sloping line of resistance in yellow. You think this is a coincidence or luck or chance? No, it's not. The algos are looking exactly at what I'm looking at right now. But in all likelihood, if gold pulls back to retest 1,835, the three amigos, we gotta wait and see if that holds. If it does, then 100% 
gold will move higher and break above the sloping line of resistance in yellow. What about the 10 year yield? What's going on here? A massive drop, a reversal candle, losing the support of 1.94%. And perhaps we're looking down at 1.77% for support. Could this be good news for NASDAQ bulls? Perhaps. The problem is, it could also be a knee-jerk reaction on Friday that people rush to buy bonds. We know that bonds are garbage right now. If you want safety, go with oil, commodities, and gold. Maybe the knee-jerk reaction will reverse this week. and We will see the 10-year yield moving higher again. But the technicals alone say we have a reversal. So using the technicals alone, in all likelihood, the chart will move down to retest 1.77% as resistance. And if that happens, then the chart of the TLT bond prices will move higher to retest 140 as resistance and perhaps all the way to 149 once again. Yet bear in mind, the weekly chart for the TLT remains negative. We're seeing higher volume on the down days. We're seeing negative divergences on both the RSI and MACD indicators. So the outlook remains intact. Yields higher, TLT down. What about the VIX? Four hours chart, look at that. It caught the support of 20 and it moved higher, a massive prop of over 50% in a couple of days. Unbelievable. Is this bullish or bearish for the VIX? The answer is, it is highly bullish. Now, what does that mean for the SPY? Because they trade in tandem. VIX goes higher, SPY goes down. If the outlook is highly bullish for the VIX, then it is highly bearish for the SPY. We have a double bottom for the VIX at 20, the most important support. The MACD indicator is creating green impressions on the histogram. From a four hours perspective, these are all good signs for the VIX. The problem is, look at the RSI. It is now getting too extended. Nothing goes higher or lower in one shot. You gotta stop, you gotta take a break, and then resume the move higher again in the VIX. It could happen. What if the SPY gaps higher in the morning? And then we see sell the rip once again. And you see a drop down in the VIX. It gets bought. And we see the VIX moving higher, perhaps cracking above 33 once again. Very possible. And here is the four hours chart for the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ. Yet again, we have a crossing in the MACD indicator, creating green impression in the histogram. And that produced a pop of about 36% in the VXN. Is it over now? Not really. It has more room to go. In the RSI, the MACD, plenty of room to go. And we have yet to see a reversal signal in the VXN. So the assumption for now is VXN higher, Q's down. What about Apple? Look at this. It looked good. It kept the support of 172.4. It was a formation of a bull flag. And then what happened? It failed miserably and now the bull flag is out of the picture and instead we have a double top we also have higher than average volume on the down days we're also seeing negative divergences in both the rsi and macd indicators what does that mean not a good look for apple here and if apple goes down so will the market tesla an hourly chart anything to see here not really we're looking at the gap at around 846 we have yet to close this gap the chart is way oversold from an hourly perspective you could see a pop in the morning but again the assumption is sell the rip for now when we look at the daily chart it doesn't look good for tesla it is breaking below the trend line we're seeing a bear flag you gotta see it with the assumption that any pop we get you're gonna sell the rip until and unless we get clear and solid reliable signals of a reversal in the q's chart the SPY's chart, on the IWM chart, but all of that will not mean anything at all without a change in the stance of the Fed's policy. Bitcoin, what's going on here? Tulips, the daily chart, it is going down, retest 42,000 as support, as I predicted, and as I would like, by the way. If that retest holds and we see a pop from 42,000, then we have a solid, reliable signal the BTC is out of the woods and perhaps Bitcoin and cryptos will outperform the stock market in the days and perhaps weeks to come. And lastly, what about AMC? Bucking the trend on Friday, closing in the green, we saw the saucer bottom and it went all the way to retest 21 as resistance. It did not break above 21. By the way, it retested 21 pretty much to the penny. The highs of the day were 20.96 and it pulled back. Is it a failure? Is it a rejection? The answer is no. In all likelihood, it's gonna give it another shot to break above 21. And it might be successful this time around. But if it does, we will see high momentum in meme stocks once again. AMC, GameStop, specifically if actual stocks are down, yet these two trade in the green, it's gonna catch the eye of retail investors to go back to meme stocks. Perhaps meme stocks is safety now. I'm joking, of course. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar? 
calendar this week. On Monday, the most anticipated event will be Mr. Bullard speaking. And then on Tuesday, we have the PPI, the Producer Price Index. We also have the Empire State Manufacturing Index. Wednesday, highly important, we have Retail Sales Import Price Index along with industrial production we also have business inventories the home builders index most importantly the fomc minutes thursday 17th we have initial jobless claims per usual then we have housing starts building permits the philadelphia manufacturing index once again james bullard speaking along with loretta mister from the cleveland fed and lastly on friday february 18th we have existing home sales and another fed zombie Governor Waller speaking. Now, what about the earnings calendar this week? Tuesday, we have Marriott and Airbnb. Wednesday, we have Barrick Gold, Shopify, Nutrin, DoorDash, NVIDIA, Cisco, and Applied Materials. Thursday, we have Walmart. And lastly, on Friday, John Deere. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.